fame, celebrity and a fortune, something I think we'd all like, but how would it change your life? Tonight we'll be looking at what all three meant for a familiar West Country face. For Brian Jones, life changed forever in March 1999 when he flew around the world in a balloon. Along with fame and an OBE came a cool million dollars in prize money. Enough to leave anyone with their head in the clouds. But not so Brian Jones. Scott Ellis has met him to find how fame has led to a very down-to-earth adventure. Well, this is dawn on the 10th of January, somewhere in the African desert. This is a journey into the desert, to the face of poverty. It's an adventure which begins in the African skies, on man's first flight around the world in a balloon. The journey is all the more remarkable for the West Country balloonist, Brian Jones. He never expected to be the pilot, nor reach celebrity status. This is something special, really. The Times, Monday, March the 22nd, 1999. Um, it is special, because not too many people get on the front page their picture of the Times, do they? As a keen aviator, Brian Jones has plenty of like-minded neighbours in Somerset. They're pilots who fly for fun and who weren't going to miss the chance to hear of aviation's last great adventure firsthand. For Brian, there's a chance of a bit of payback. He can tell them about his charity, The Winds of Hope, and who knows, there might be another deal to be done. Thank you very much. Popular Flying Association are meeting here, and this is one of their monthly meetings. They don't, apparently they don't usually get as many people as this, but uh, for some reason they've all turned up, probably to pay their subs. But it's, um, it's within this area. It's local, and it's nice to meet some of the local pilots, so I'm delighted, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, of course, and I know what you're all thinking. Is he a proper pilot? Brian Jones had been working as the project manager for the Breitling Round the World flight when he volunteered to be the reserve pilot. Everything changed overnight when the two original pilots parted company. Well, the next morning it was announced that the two pilots for the Breitling Orbiter 3 would be Bertrand Picard and, uh, and Brian Jones. We had to wait some three months before a weather slot came up. But we went up like a, a veritable rocket. It took us a while to uh, sort the balloon out, but sort it out we did. And eventually we sort of sat down uh, in our seats at the, in the cockpit and looked out of the windows, and this was the sort of sight that we saw, just extraordinary. We'd taken off on Bertrand's 41st birthday, and so I'd found this football, uh, awful thing it was. And when you hit it, it sang that awful football song, you know, ole, 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 we have a chance. <laughs> That's weird. Unlike Brian, fellow pilot Bertrand Picard was born into celebrity. He's from a family of pioneering Swiss adventurers. This was his third attempt at the round the world record. 230, 87 degrees. Don't mind if I put my finger in to know if it's warm. <laughs> As long as it's only your finger. Yes. <laughs> Breakfast over the Balear Islands. You see there the um, the girl in the green green bikini. She's quite nice. Yeah? Very nice. Because mm. she has a big husband with her. Yes, but the one the pink monokini on the beach, just left of the uh, of the umbrella. Oh, yes. You sure that's not a boy? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now we're going to uh, drop one of our tanks and try and get ourselves a little bit lighter so that we can climb without burning. OK, cutting now. Yeah. 
Thousands of feet below lies the African desert, a landscape which would loom large on this trip. The pilots flew over it twice, once at the start of the journey, where they picked up winds eastward around the world. Three weeks later, they were back, touching down in the African desert. Both pilots became captivated by what they saw from their new home high in the African sky. <laughs> Trying to clean, um, I think, some bird doo-doo from the outside of the porthole. Not only trying to clean, cleaning. <laughs> We just loved the desert and we'd sit together in the front of this capsule and we'd look out of the windows and we thought, what is it that makes two people, or us in this case, so privileged to actually be sitting in this balloon flying over this magnificent scenery? And if we took a telescope and looked closely at some of the countries we were flying over, we'd see children dying and it just didn't make any sense at all. It was at that moment the two pilots made a pact. If they made it round the world and won the million dollar prize money, they'd come back to help Africa's children. But if we succeeded, we had to do something about this. We had to make a difference. Three years on and they're keeping the promise. The million dollar prize money is being invested in Africa in the former French colony of Niger. We found this awful disease, it's called Noma, and not many people have heard of it. It's a disease that starts in the mouth, it affects children between the ages of two and six. It kills 85% of the children that get it. This is Abdullah Hamid, and you can see that uh, this is a little boy who's had Noma and has really not been treated until recently. And the Noma started in the mouth unusually with this little boy. It usually spreads onto the nose and then takes the eye. But what's happened here is that uh, it's gone untreated. And normally what would that condition mean for him in the village? I think that uh, he would probably be hidden from view by the other villagers because it's seen as a curse and uh, when, when, he, when it was in its worst stage it would have been completely black with white edges all from his ear to his mouth, so it would have looked absolutely awful. So it's hardly surprising that they see it as a curse, really. This, in fact, is, uh, shows you, I mean, as I was saying, you can see what, how uh, it could look so awful uh, to the rest of the village. And here it is, uh, after it's fallen off, and this was the piece of face that just fell off. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, it's just heartbreaking, really. The poor little chap is going to be scarred for life, no question about that. You want to get him on? Merci. Merci. So. Noma's been called, rightly so, the face of poverty. What happens here is that there is a cow dung and uh, animal feces all over the place and the children are getting that on their hands and put that together with lack of vitamins and malnutrition and you get you know the, the perfect scenario for uh, disease now most of the children in this village will probably have this bleeding gums gingivitis and it's some of those children that once uh, a bacteria gets into those bleeding gums that's what leads to noma so what we're trying to do is uh, get an education program going in a in health centres in villages like this to actually teach the locals to be more aware of oral hygiene. That sounds easy but of course in practice with some 3,000 villages here in Niger it's not quite so easy. It is a huge task but the jones picar combination had already conquered the world in a balloon and they draw strength from the problems they overcame in the skies. Yes absolutely. I remember one day Bertrand sticking his hands on the table in front of him. He looks at me in the eye and says, Brian, I have to tell you I'm a little afraid. And I said, Bertrand, you have no idea how good that makes me feel <laughs> because I'm really scared. Now, I didn't use those words, but you get the drift. We're suffering with uh, uh, lack of breath, really. We were panting. I'd been in bed for, I don't know, five, six hours. And I woke up and I heard Bertrand uh, 
panting the same. And uh, clearly there was a problem. And what was happening was that either we'd forgotten to change one of our life support filters, or we had changed it and um, it wasn't working. Uh, but whatever the reason, we were being slowly poisoned by carbon dioxide fumes. So I got out of the bun and kind of stuck an oxygen mask on it and stuck one on the face. Uh, after, after a few minutes, we started to feel much better. In the medical debrief afterwards, uh, the doctor suggested that we probably only had another couple of hours then uh, when we would simply drift off to sleep and not wake up and the brightening orbit of three would have done it all on its own, I think. Right, well, we're off to uh, see the president now. It's, uh, I know we saw him last year, but this visit is really important because we need his uh, continuing support uh, in order to bring all of the people together. That's from the health ministry, the WHO and the various NGOs. And in order to get them to work together and that the people in the villages will trust us, then he needs to uh, give his blessing. Remarkably, President Mamdou Tanja hadn't even heard of Noma before he met the two pilots for the first time last year. He's learning fast. Et maintenant, nous avons parlé avec M. Picard l'année dernière à la même période. On s'est retrouvé ici. It was great. Um, he was very enthusiastic. He uh, did more talking than we did, in fact, and uh, he listened to with pleasure with the fact that everybody seems to be coming together at long last to combat Noma. He was um, horrified with the pictures we used in our brochure and uh, clearly said that this picture should be on the television channels in uh, Niger, just because the mothers, he, this is what he said, the mothers will be asking why. Why should this be happening in Niger? To go around the world, you don't only need to be a, a balloonist, you need to be a diplomat and a politician to negotiate every overflight permission. I saw on one map, that they saw that they shoot down all the airplanes who are coming there and they shoot without warning. This helped us to understand that the way to negotiate is not to push our ideas through. It is first to understand the mentality of the people you talk to. And when you understand the other one, then the other one can understand you and you can really pull at the same rope together. I must get Hotel Romeo Alpha. Much appreciated, so remain this frequency. We'll go. If we can operate the same type of, I don't know, humility of politics almost mm. in working with Winds of Hope, yes. it's, it's sure, sure to be the way to go. Exactly. We're not here to tell them what they have to do. Exactly, yeah. We're here to understand their problems and to give them the money to go further into the solutions. The man in Niger is Maman Kaka, a former dentist now working for the World Health Organization. Okay. Coming also to meet you to see how the project is going. Uh -huh. it's good, nice. So we're very happy to be back. Let's go. With the president's backing, they can now get down to business. Hard talk with government officials, checking the money is being spent wisely and that progress towards eradicating Noma is being made. Any whiff of corruption and the payouts will stop. By our standards, Niger's politics are volatile. This is the country's third health minister in a year. Brian, meanwhile, has a problem all of his own. The talk is all in French. On occasions like this, Bertrand and I always speak with one voice, and so I don't feel I need to add anything. Nous parlons de la même voix. <laughs> Niger is one of the poorest countries in the world, where one in four children dies before the age of five. A third of the country's 10 million inhabitants rely on food handouts. Without them, they would starve. So Noma is just one problem among many, not least the spread of malaria and now AIDS. That was one reason the pilots chose to fund Noma. They felt it wasn't getting enough attention, despite causing an estimated 100,000 deaths each year worldwide.
The only help so far has come from international charities. They've paid for this Noma clinic in the city of Zander, for example. It's where five-year-old Hassan comes for daily health checks. The equipment is basic. While we were there, the lights failed, so the nurses worked by torchlight. Hassan survived Noma, but will need an operation to rebuild his face. That means a trip to Europe for surgery. It was in a Swiss hospital that Bertrand Picard first became aware of the disease. Surgery is expensive and painful, which is why, long term, the pilots want Noma eradicated. They're about to witness their early efforts coming good. It'll be a defining moment, just like the day they decided to cross the Atlantic. Brightling Orbiter 3, I just wanted to say that there is an absolute way to fail in this flight, it's to quit now. What we want is not just to have those records of duration and distance, we really would like to go all the way around, so we both are on the opinion that we have to take that risk. Okay, we're on our way across the Atlantic. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. I hope the Atlantic will be nice with us again. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. They crossed the Atlantic. Now they're crossing the desert. That's where Noma can be beaten. It should be particularly interesting today because Maman has got the mouthwash with him and uh, mm. I think we're going to try and, and teach the children a yeah. little oral hygiene. Yes, because if we clean a child, it's, it might seem ridiculous. Yeah. Like the European coming to clean Africa, yeah. Yeah. to clean the face of Africa. Yeah. But what we really have to do is to train the mothers to do it. Yes. That's the only meaning. Okay, so uh, this little boy has uh, quite bad mouth here, the sores on, on the gums. And his yeah. teeth, what the condition of the teeth? You have not a possibility to, to, to rinse his mouth. It's, it's a, 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 a typical condition we can uh, have a, 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 a noma. So this is just a simple mouthwash. Yes. And uh, uh, just to show uh, to his mother mm -hmm. how to rinse the mouth. Okay, after he's eaten? Uh, after, after, after he's yes. eaten. Chuga! Mm. If three years ago uh, Sidhu had been found with the, the gingivitis and if uh, somebody in the village, the health worker or the mother, had been trained to see this problem and had actually cleaned the mouth, then, then this wouldn't have happened. At that stage, you can still use this, this cheap, uh, liquid, this mouthwash, just normal antiseptic mouthwash. If they use that once a day, then that will stop. It abs that will stop that bacteria dead in its tracks, and no more won't happen. To use a modern term, this is ground zero for us, and this is the trainer talking to the mothers themselves and telling them what to look for and telling them what to do if they find a problem. There are 168 trainers now since, uh, since the end of October have been trained to train. These people are now spreading into the regions and those trainers will train 2,020 health workers to look for this. So that's almost a health worker for a